My favorite part of size coding is the moment when <laughs> you reach the byte limit. <laughs> I think that's everyone's favorite part of size coding. Um, it's such an immense feeling of achievement, especially I think the longer you've been, the longer I've been working on uh, a, a production, uh, attempting to crunch it down to a certain size, when it does finally get under that limit, uh, it's a really exhilarating feeling. Um, and uh, I think that's my favorite part of size coding. You know, I haven't thought much about it, but in general, it's the initial creation of the intro, including a prototype in a high-level language, maybe uh, experiments with improving and adding more effects and optimization to, to everything. Code golfing and making it under the size limit. My favorite part about size coding is uh, to be able uh, to tinker around with ideas to try uh, how they work and if they are uh, possible to be implemented in uh, 256 bytes or less and to see the final result or kind of evolution where you try a new thing, uh, you optimize a bit and maybe you add something and you see some form of evolution of some idea and until you get your final result which you can release. My favorite part is the last phase, the code golfing, hunting for the last bytes. It's just playing around with the pieces, like where can I optimize a bit? Do I have a new instruction for this part? Or what if I do this music to this graphics? Or what if I replace it, that core of uh, graphics, that core of uh, code for graphics with this one? So it's just um, freestyling around with ideas and to see if I either reach um, a design goal or something which breaks through the threshold of something like this has not been there in that size or this size has not been reached or this, this, this that sounds new. So this um, doing these experiments and spending my time with it and just letting it flow is, is the most uh, favorite part. Ah, uh, when you're optimizing, you get that last bite off so that it fits. That's, that's sort of the best part. My favourite part of size coding, I'd have to say, is the surprises. That moment when you're in the uh, code golfing stage and you've not quite clawed back as many bytes as you need, so then you start just trying out of unexpected things that you wouldn't really think of doing in any other context. Just, okay, well, I don't know if this is going to do what I want, but I might as well try it out. And then suddenly, it just takes things into a totally different direction. Uh, I remember during the uh, Love by Battlegrounds last year, during the Rainbow Round, I think there was just one point when I to changed the sign from positive to negative and it added this uh, twist to the rainbow and thought, well, I didn't expect that at all, but yeah, let's run with that. Let's see, uh, let's see where that goes. Uh, so it's kind of the, like, as Bob Ross would say, it's the uh, happy little accidents. I think the favorite part for me is like I have an idea, then I code it in basic, yeah, very ancient. So I always start with a basic code and then I transform it to assembler language. And then I hopefully see that it kind of can be possible to do a intro based on that. That for me is the best part where I see some code working in basic and then I see, okay, it can be done. My favorite part is when you solve the puzzle. So you have a gut feeling that something is doable, but you don't know how. And then you spend something like hours, days, or maybe even months uh, thinking about it and prototyping perhaps it. And then it hits you like, this is how it might work. And this is the best part. You know, after you solve the puzzle, it's just a matter of polishing, optimizing, squeezing bytes. But then the key problems have been solved and, and it actually starts to get a little bit boring to me. I think it made me discover some programming techniques that I normally don't have a reason to discover. But uh, I don't know how to best describe it, but uh, sometimes you can become stuck while solving a certain problem. And 
you have to step back and consider some alternative approach, maybe even something unorthodox. And this is also a certain mindset that you develop over time and it can help you also in other projects. It's when you uh, are able to uh, redo uh, some part of your intro using, for example, different algorithm or different approach and you cut the bytes not by one or two, uh, like usually you do when you optimize the code, but like dozen of bytes or 20 or 30 bytes because just you came with very new idea how to do the things and because when you have it it opens a space for for example very new effect or sound added to to your intro and i think that's uh, that's a great feeling for me my favorite part is probably the code golfing at the end basically when you are a few bytes over then go to bed and at the middle of the night, you suddenly have an idea how to save a few more bytes. And then you get up the next day, try that out, and it actually makes it fit. That's a great feeling. For me, it's usually when I code the prototype and I see the effect in motion for the first time and I think to myself, this needs to exist in my size category. I think when it comes to collaborations, it's hard to really pick out anyone as a superstar of size coding without also having to ask myself, well, what would I bring to the table? There is obviously the whole uh, sort of code golfing, bouncing code back and forth, oh, you could save this byte here, which is a lot of fun, but I think it, that's a lot of fun regardless of uh, who you're working with. Um, Although one thing that I really would like to do on the Tick 80 someday when I have the capacity for it would be to team up with someone who's at the top of the game on the whole ray marching types of high level maths, someone like uh, Nusan or Tomcat and um, see how that sort of technique could work in the setting of a full size demo. I like to work together with my group mates. I really enjoyed the making of 549 notes with Arnold. I would love to work with Erwin on a C64 intro and also with God on a ZX Spectrum intro. As an active promoter of pair programming at work, of course, I would like to work with some other size coder on some production. And I think there are many uh, who I could think of here, like Helmut or Sensenstahl or Vola or others. Uh, it just depends on the idea, maybe on the kind of uh, platform and also maybe on, on the kind of part one is taking over or maybe it's just some form of ping pong between the two. I've lucked out and, and uh, I got to work with some interesting size coders like Helmut and Cucumber and I don't know if there's anyone else right now. Uh, you know, people who, who know Apple II and 6502 programming you know, aren't that common. This one was a hard one. There are so many great ones, but thinking quickly, Illuminate and Sense and Style come to my mind. Former so I could learn some old school magic and latter so I could learn how to do tiny exe graphics. And, um, <clears throat> Of course, most of my technical tricks I've, I've stolen from Super Rogue and Helmut, so it would be great to see what kind of technical feats we could pull off together. And I think my pick would be again Denzenstahl, because I already did uh, a demo with him together. Um, and that turned out to be a good one. So, and to maybe extend the question a bit, uh, it would be a person who is rather known for unusual or stylistic ideas rather than a technical uh, coder because I'm such a guy myself and the combination of, of these two things uh, is what I think makes a good intro and having another technician so to speak uh, in an intro would just be result in like a few bytes game maybe but not in something new so 
from all the chords I know, sentence style is the one with the most style, so it would be sentence style again. Well, I think I would like to work again with sentence style. I worked together with him already two times. One time I made a sound for a game and then we worked together on some intro. He made some part of the visuals, me another, he gave some ideas. I think we got a good combination. He's the, has a lot of cool design ideas, always top in his production. So that would be the guy to work with. I'd really like to work on a production with Sense Install. Uh, he and I have been, uh, you know, seen friends for many years and we've never done a production together and we've talked about it many times and it's never happened. Mm, not that much. I would rather work with some uh, graphicians uh, that could help me to come up together um, uh, with something uh, artistically impressive than with just a programmer. And of course musicians as well. And I worked with uh, some in the past and it was always very, very valuable. I don't think size coding productions are in general suited for collaboration. I would like to work with you, whoever you are, especially if you are a talented size coder and you are in my greeting list. Synergy usually leads to an explosive effect. I am always open to working together and will be glad to any suggestions to make a real bomb. So write me. Uh. Probably Serge from the ZX Spectrum scene. In fact, he already approached me in the past, but I couldn't commit for a variety of reasons at the time. But who knows, maybe it will happen. So I think there is no optimal line because um, it's everything in the eyes of the beholder uh, and for everybody optimal line lays somewhere else. So some people just prefer the technical things, some uh, don't accept the intros without sound um, and uh, well, it, it really depends on, uh, on, on the uh, beholder. There are probably quite a few size coders who can really appreciate just the technical side of things. But as soon as you show your production to just, well, not even the general public, but uh, just the general demo scene public, uh, it, it really helps if your production isn't completely ugly. So. Yeah, spending a few bytes, maybe, I don't know, 10% of your size on, on getting good colors and um, yeah, centering everything properly or even adding smaller design uh, features can really help. Ideally, you get both. Uh, it is true, it can be frustrating if you do some sort of amazing technical feat and no one cares because it doesn't look that cool. And it can equally be frustrating when you have something that looks really cool. I mean, it can be equally frustrating when you have something that uh, is, uh, it looks really cool but is really simple. You didn't spend much time on it at all. The optimal line is whatever the hell the programmer thinks it should be. People should make the demos that play to their own strengths, whether that's the technical side or the uh, aesthetics. Yeah, maybe don't neglect the aesthetics entirely. Uh, one of my demos on the Spectrum a long time back was uh, having 1,500 scrollers on the screen at once. And yes, it probably beat the record, but uh, it looked like trash. So um, yeah, just, yeah, don't totally lose sight of one or the other, but uh, yeah, make the demos that, uh, that show off your abilities best. Impressive coding above all else, but don't forget, your intro cannot be ugly. The optimal line is of course, that you have both, but in the end, if it doesn't look aesthetically nice, who would care about the code? I mean, you have to face it that when we 
offer those other show our intros at audiences at demo parties 90 percent or more don't care about the underlying code so i think even if it's maybe not your main interest a winning demo intro would always be the one with the interesting and not the interesting code stuff I've realized over time that having an impressive algorithm doesn't really mean anything in a competition if you can't sell it. So you should invest most of your buys into aesthetics. I don't know, but I would say um, somewhere between 64 by and 128 in one of these categories. Uh, because, why do I say that? Because um, in 64 bytes, the classic raycasting core can be can be done, or even unless I think the, the, um, in one of my intros I brought that down to 49. So in 64 you can have that 3D effect with either sound or palette or maybe even both. So so the ground foundation of something audio visual on the screen in 3D uh, would be achievable in 64. So by that logic, 128 would be the sweet spot of having something which is also like really pleasing to, to, to look at. Not just, you know, brute force 3D with some MIDI node or whatever and a very tiny palette, but you know, a, a bit more everything, but then extended. So I think that is 128 bytes. Mm, I don't actually look at it this way because I think that we should always try to come up with something which is aesthetically pleasing because I think that People are only going to appreciate the technical part if the demo also looks good. So if there's no way to develop the effect to its full potential, then in a way, it's just a wasted effort. So then it's maybe time to reconsider the approach. Is there such a line? I am sure these two things fit together perfectly. The higher the code and skill and knowledge of algorithms, the better the result. I think that what makes a coding feat impressive in the context of a demo scene is specifically when it is aesthetically pleasing, given the context. Um, so I think that, you know, for me, um, something that doesn't have any aesthetic merit on one end of the spectrum, um, but it is an impressive coding feat. It's impressive to me, but I don't think it's impressive within the context of science coding. Uh, on the other hand, something that has purely aesthetic merit, um, but is not a technical achievement, while I think it's very relevant within the demo scene at large, um, is also not relevant in the context of size coding. <laughs> so, um, drawing, I guess, personally, I draw a little line, I think, more on the end of technical achievement um, than I do on aesthetic achievement. Um, I think because I mostly approach size programming from a mathematical and computer science perspective, more so than an aesthetic perspective. Um, so for me, I'm willing to sacrifice a lot in my productions in terms of aesthetics in order to achieve a technical result. Um, I think more than some people, maybe more than average in the community. I think when the actual result makes you wonder how the fuck this was done. I'm quite squarely in the artistically pleasing camp, but frankly, I think they go somewhat hand in hand. So as pulling off a... Uh, <clears throat> Really, article pleasing result usually requires some pretty deep technical mastery, but the reverse, of course, is not true. Sometimes crazy code does not create very artistically pleasing results. Well, I think it is uh, just difficult to find an optimum, especially if you have uh, a size limit and not many bytes left. But you should try to let the effect look less boring, at least. The 
multi-part intro category was already killed by Helmut's intro. Memories has very different parts and very cool transitions between the parts. I think uh, I overrated it, especially this um, Memories. I don't like it at all. No, I'm kidding. Um, if you're doing a multi-part intro, that's always nice, but it's also um, hard to like to come up with with good effects which can uh, be combined into each other. Like the idea of having the most tiny effects possible chained together and fading between them, uh, I have done that. So this is, was a technical execution of um, what people have been asking for. But if you wanna have nice effects, then the number of effects, of course, goes down. I think my cooperation with Dungeon Star uh, Quattro with four effects and 256 bytes was more in the direction where it should be because memories had eight or seven, and it depends on how you count it, effects, but the effects in itself were like okay-ish, while the four effects of, um, of Quattro obviously look better, like they, they have more more appeal, they are better arranged, they are better presented. So if there's an idea missing for a coder, he can always go multi-effects and fade between them or arrange them some somewhat on the screen like a like a movie strip or like a grid or so yeah, if you have no idea then go for multi-part I guess. I think the pure technical multi-part intro like like memories we just show off how many small effects you can do in 256 bytes. That is basically done now. I don't think you can do much interesting there anymore. Um, that's not to say that Memories wasn't interesting. Memories was great, but yeah, just doing that over and over is, is, is a little bit repetitive and boring. I do believe that there's still room to do some multi-part intros with some kind of concept behind it. I think that could be cool. What is multi-part intros? An intro with several effects like memories or when one intro is continuation of another? Anyway, I feel good about both, why not? I believe that there's value in a multi-part intro, but unless it's just uh, different parameter settings for your effect, I believe there needs to be something that ties the effects together. Some kind of narrative or an atmosphere you want to convey. Well, considering that I try to cram up as much uh, parts to my intros as possible, I must be solidly in the multi-part intro camp. but. But I have to agree that it's a challenge to have uh, enough variation between different parts so that people don't immediately see that it's actually just a single effect, that you're changing parameters. Um, I think I managed to do this best in Crackle Base, in that uh, I was actually just changing the parameter, but, but, but Jobe was fooled. He thought that I had more than one effect going on, even though it was actually just a single effect that, where we changed parameters different, between different parts. I think, again, uh, it depends on the context within which it's done. Um, I think especially when there's a way to do multiple parts and tie those parts together thematically, then it can have a really impressive effect. Um, one thing that I really love in productions in general, but and you don't see a lot in, in size coding, but I really love it when I see it, are uh, tiny intros that have a narrative to them in some sense. I mean, it doesn't obviously have to be like a strict narrative or a literal narrative, but has some has a cohesive feel to it and doesn't just feel like something pretty on the screen, but feels like it's conveying something. It's conveying an idea or an emotion or a concept that's not purely some technical spinning box or some uh, some pretty little thing, but like actually um, has some humanity to it. 
I think there can be a handful of those over time, but in general, I think you're better spend your bytes on one good effect rather than splitting it up to several not so good effects. What is your opinion on multi-part intros? Actually, I don't find them too interesting because I would always ask why you did not compete in a lower size category with that because often also it means that you compensate the visuals f for more uh, parts instead of improving the visuals for uh, one part on 65 byte product so not too much interested in that multi-part intros are great I think it gets to the heart of what people love about demo compos and when you're just sitting there just seeing it to evolve and carry on and thinking okay how much did they get into this okay this is getting silly now so yeah just yeah that's really love that uh, kind of entertainment value i can understand why that sometimes like uh to Helmut says that uh memories of isn't the demo he's most proud of um there's that maybe the feeling that it's showmanship above something that's got more sort of artistic integrity but i think there's a place for both i think sometimes things can just be the code equivalent of tony hawk doing skateboard tricks and i think there's there is also an art to that sort of showmanship and to being able to create things that seem bigger than they really are to like making something look like multiple effects when it's kind of variants of one thing so yeah i think let, let's have more of that Multi-part intros are nice because it's not only about uh, the technical difficulties, but also about finding ways, uh, for example, to blend uh, two scenes into each other also. I mean, why not? Uh, there are examples where this approach clearly works. Uh, it's just that uh, there must be enough variety to sustain the attention of the viewer. Because typically there's like a progressive change to some of the effects parameters and if it's too obvious or if it drags on for too long then the wow effect is lost but uh, if it's executed properly why not i also like them a lot and not only like multi-part but an intro with progress that has some opening and that is leading to some big bang um, so uh, so I also know how hard it is to create a multi-part intro with size coding, so uh, I just appreciate when it's there. And I'm not sure what that means exactly. Um... I don't know if it means if you just start out coding to see what you get, if that's better than trying to design top down. And uh, I don't know. I have to admit, I do more of the first than the second. Oh, I don't think so. Making tiny intro with brute force and code is just a dream of lazy coders. I have to think about this for a second because I'm not sure what brute forced code means relative to designed production. Um, I'm not quite sure about that question, but I don't want to watch 100,000 8-byte intros to find it out. I'm not sure about that. Yeah, I'm not sure what that means, so I'm going to skip it. <laughs> and brute force it to 56-byte intro sounds crappy. Of course, I admit that it's possible to create some kind of artificial intelligence that will go over instructions that are somehow logically uh, related to each other. And you also need to evaluate results somehow. Uh, I'm not aware of any implementation attempts for such things yet. If you just iterate overall possible combination, then I'm afraid uh, that our generation will not even live to go through all six byte intros. Root forcing, I'm not sure if anybody is using some uh, 
something like super optimizer to uh, to iterate through the code to 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 just brute force it because still you would need to have um, a watcher who who would evaluate the output of this brute force code and until we use some neural network that will do the work for you to estimate if the output is good good looking and good sounding then uh, i'm not sure if uh, brute forcing is going to be used nowadays i guess it might be computationally feasible to brute force all four byte intros uh, given some constraint like uh, <clears throat> disregarding illegal opcodes and stuff like that but uh, <clears throat> You could then evaluate their fitness using some kind of cost function. But I think the real problem here is what is that cost function? So um, if humans are doing the evaluation, you, you can't even forget about brute forcing all four byte intros. So the short answer is no, I don't think that brute forcing code to produce good size coding intros is at, at all, probably at all possible. That said, I think there are cases where something like brute forcing makes sense. So in 2D form, in one of my intros, what I did is that I had a basic tunnel effect, but I wanted to change between the parts. Um, and I did this by mutating floating point opcodes. And um, <clears throat> each part is done by changing a single opcode. So in this limited space of alternatives, um, uh, all the different variations with different opcodes, I actually made a shader, which displays all the variants side by side. And I saw uh, in, in that big, quick overview, I could see all the variants uh, um, on screen. So then I was able to pick quite quickly what variants I liked. I think that has to be like four byte or eight byte or whatever. Um, I, have, I have also tried a lot of stuff with genetic uh, coding, not for size coding, but in general genetic coding. And um, I've done a few calculations and thoughts like how you would brute force some code and the the problem is the evaluation of what's going on. Um, you can of course have a framework which always produces an output and then rate that somehow. Let's take that as a given, you have a, a setup with let's say a cellular automaton or rule 110 thing, whatever, like something goes on the screen and you even are advanced enough to have developed a neural network which um, decides statistically between uh, zero and 100 how good um, the thing on the screen looks, then you would still have to train this network and you would have to supervise these uh, results, like to see what's what's uh, coming from it, and just from the mere like possibility of even eight byte, that is like like sixty four bits, and is the effect just the effect, not the framework? Is the effect in itself is eight bytes, which is very small? Then you have two to the power of sixty four possibilities, and you have to spend. Uh, time greater than zero nanoseconds to evaluate what you have. And even if that is automated, it's very hard to think of something which is just brute force without any smart uh, technique behind it to... It's hard to imagine that something can can be achieved that would like beat a fractal in 16 bytes. Um, I mean, maybe occasionally you will have a thing that produces a fractal in 16 bytes, but the possibility of finding it and is close to zero. This is at least my opinion. I know about um, differentiable programming where you can like, um, yeah, it's hard to explain. Differentiable programming is like a, a class of algorithm and you can in theory try to do something on a CPU, but to, uh, to make the atomic instructions of a CPU differentiable is, you know, that sounds like multiple PhD projects at once. I think it's very hard. So I don't think very positive about brute force code above a size of, let's say, 16 bytes. I think it's not possible. I don't know if I understand the question correctly, but I think the very tiny sizes like 8 and 16 bytes are a place where 
one can try this approach and be successful. If there is, I don't think we've found it yet. I remember a, a few years back there was the uh, puppy farmer thing from uh, Scomp and Fell, which uh, was trying to explore this with 32 byte intros. And as far as I remember, there wasn't anything groundbreaking that came out of that. Um, but I think when you get down to like 8 byte intros, it sort of feels like, yeah, surely we're getting close to the sort of search space that's possible there. I think I think there's still like a 20 digit number of possible intros there. But uh, it, yeah, it feels like, yeah, maybe you could create a neural network to assess the interestingness of the outputs and maybe narrow things down that way. Um, it's, there must be an interesting research topic for someone there. So whoever that someone is, go out and do it and report back. Maybe it could work for something like 8 or 16 bytes, but uh, coming up with the generator might not be necessarily trivial. And I'm sure it would raise many philosophical objections like uh, who actually wrote the code? Yes, absolutely, but don't ask me what size exactly. But yeah, uh, when you go down to the very smallest sizes that are possible on your platform, whatever that might be, um, you basically just try to come up with some idea to, I don't know, fill the whole screen or whatever and then see, well, just try around with a few remaining bytes to see what kind of effect might be possible there. Um, and, and then it's a gradual thing as you go up to larger sizes when you still might just sacrifice a lot of your effect to, to save a few bytes and maybe lose quite a bit of the design you initially had. I'm sure it is definitely possible. But the intro would look like an intro of several size categories smaller to be able to fit in all the audio. So I don't think it's a good trade-off. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, that being said, I think there obviously has to be a trade-off. Um, but ideally, uh, when done well, and I think Helmut is well known for this, um, audio and visuals and tiny intros can have a really synergistic effect. So I don't think it's just a question of you know, I don't think it's a zero of some game where, like, if you take something away from the visuals and add to the audio, that like you're not necessarily improving the overall quality of the, of the prod. I think that when the audio and the visuals complement each other, even if the visuals could have been better without the audio, uh, when they complement each other, I think that the overall effect can be so much greater than what could have been done with just visuals alone. Um, and I think that's definitely been done. It's really hard to do well, but uh, yeah, it's definitely doable. And uh, I have a lot of respect for it. That very much depends on your definition of great audio, but in my opinion, no. Yes, of course, totally. I think upwards of, uh, of a size of 128 bytes, you can have, in fact, a fully functioning 3D engine and polyphonic sound, it's not a problem. So, uh, if you doubt that, uh, please hit me on Discord and let's talk. It's possible. Again, it depends on your platform. Something like DOS, where you just write a byte to the MIDI and you get it, is nice. Something like the Apple II, where you have to have either cycle counted or an entire interrupt handler and, and, uh, fan and frequency tables make it a lot harder to do that in a very tiny intro. Mm, I think the real question is, so uh, can we have both at the same time? Because adding audio represents a non-trivial overhead, I would say. But uh, I'm optimistic because this area is still relatively unexplored. 
I think this is um, possible and also just um, a kind of a trade-off again. And there are effects which are already very nice in 64 bytes or also 128 bytes. So you can, of course, take one of these uh, smaller size effects which are still impressive and add some also impressive audio to it. This is what I think. And maybe we are just uh, not limited to MIDI or byte beat. So um, there is also room for some new ways to create music or sounds. Uh, I think it's very hard to do both, but it's possible. Uh, but whenever you put more bytes on side of audio, the the visual side will suffer. So it's about finding a balance. But uh, I believe um, it's uh, if somebody finds a way to combine with the same algorithm to create great visual effects and audio, I think that's the the winning uh, entry then. If you're only talking about up to 256 bytes, then I don't think you really can have great audio. You can, however, have good enough audio. That is, audio that does make the intro better than it would be without it. But then, when you go to 512 bytes, I, I do believe that you can have great audio, yes. Absolutely. First, you can use MIDI in intros for those box, and it's quite powerful technology that does not require excessively large code to use. Second, there are already at least two excellent works with high quality music synthesis from Provot and Frag, uh, somehow, and Ikaban or Ikobun. Third, ByteBeat has good potential. For example, listen to the recent work of Chaos Constructor from Marky Design. Only in 512 byte and 1K intros could have really great audio. In the 256 byte intro, which has really great visual effect, there is not enough room for music. Certainly, yes. I mean, for 256 bytes, you just make a killer 128 byte intro and then you have a liberal 128 bytes for the music. Done. I think the most improvement can be done in telling a story, uh, having a narrative, getting emotions across. This is, I think, where we can improve uh, the most as a, as a community. And secondly, it's about generating sound, I think, like how to make stuff sound good and like, at least in terms of uh, techno-related sounds, sound uh, realistic, like good snares, good kicks, good instruments, and not, not me, not please, not, not me. So story and sound, because I think we have a good foundation about the graphics, the effects, 3D, ray tracing, ray casting, parallax effects, fractals, whatever. We um, are able to produce a lot of good gradients for palettes and, and whatnot. But what we lack the most, I think, is telling a story with a good sound and good graphics. I think the biggest room for improvement is on the audio side uh, because there is a lot of stuff which, which can still be implemented in this size and uh, we shouldn't limit ourselves uh, to MIDI and byte beats. Definitely in sound generation and compression, including the use of byte code. We can also create new platforms for size coding. For example, a framework under which the code will be run. This framework can run in DOS, Windows, Linux, etc. Provide an API for basic things like selecting and installing a video mode and sound device when starting an intro, drawing primitives or even 3D elements, generating a palette and sound, running code in 
multiple threads, etc. Some interests are made like fragment shaders when a color is calculated for each pixel based on coordinates and time. You could draw using not one, but multiple, four, nine, uh, eight, 16, uh, 32 threads. The intro will work much faster. Well, I was about to say music, but seeing the entries in Function 2022, I can see that there's a lot of uh, great progress in, by many different authors in this front. So perhaps I'll say tooling this time. We need audio tools, we need compression tools, we need debugging and dev tools, and you name it, everything. More tools um, and more effort put into tools by more people uh, would be a huge boon to the size coding community. I think the 500 terabyte category has the most room for improvement. But we will see. I believe that intro coders as a whole would benefit from learning color theory and design principles, which I really struggle with. And also my platform of choice, which is DOS, suffers from compatibility issues. So you have, usually have to limit yourself to hardware, which is 25 years old. Mm, I'm actually quite happy where things are now. Uh, maybe we could be more open-minded towards embracing modern platforms because we are not making it really easy for people to run our programs and for someone who's not already an insider it can it can represent a certain barrier but uh, other than that i think we are good i don't know uh, i think it's going fine as it is the the most room for improvement is in uh, aesthetics and uh, and conceptual or the thinking so mostly people are focusing on doing uh, the effect and so but even if it's an old school effect then it's in my opinion it could be just a starting point for doing something uh, um, uh, artistic so 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 i believe the we are missing the the actual art in many intros and I think that was the last question, so I hope you enjoyed my answers and thank you all for, uh, for listening. Thanks.